Before we truly begin, I would like to start by saying that there are references to people of color, meaning people with more melanin in their skin than others, in the descriptions that I have found. I do not agree that people should be referenced as such, but, to get the point across, I must use such archaic descriptions, and for that, I apologize. I may have been born and raised in the South, but that does not mean that all Southerners are uneducated and ignorant. That is a notion of ignorant people. I do wish that you will enjoy the story that I have chosen, and I wish that you will learn from it. It is fact and a part of our history that must be remembered, lest we repeat it once again. By the year 1900, people of color, namely people of African and Caribbean descent, were free from enslavement less than 50 years, and even in the city of New Orleans, they were still considered less than those of the Caucasian varieties. Jim Crow laws were fully in effect, and the stance of separate but equal was in full swing, though rarely were people of color considered equal to the bigoted. This is the stage for the following horrors to occur. Mr. Robert Charles of Mississippi was self-educated, highly intelligent, and very well read. He followed the teachings of the controversial and radical black leader slash pan-Africanist Bishop Henry M. Turner. Bishop Turner, a native of Georgia, USA, preached that blacks should defend themselves with guns against the Ku Klux Klan and other white racist institutions that sought to destroy and kill black people in the United States. Robert Charles also felt that black people should consider returning to their ancestral home of Africa, in particular, the nation of Liberia, which was founded by former black U.S. slaves in 1822, to escape from the white supremacist power structure in the USA. Mr. Charles was also a sales agent for Turner's magazine, Voice of Missions, which talked about some of the previously mentioned beliefs in exact full detail and analysis. In 1896, Robert Charles joined the International Migration Society, a group which advocated sending black Americans to Liberia. Mr. Charles honestly felt that no black person would ever receive full treatment as a citizen and human being in a country where the violent lynching of a black person took place every day. This country was also the same place where blacks were, by all accounts, not even allowed to vote or receive equal treatment and protection under the law. The Plessy v. Ferguson ruling of 1896 by the U.S. Supreme Court had legalized segregation. This, in theory, meant that blacks were allowed to be treated separately, but as equals of whites. However, in reality, this meant that blacks were forced by law to endure harsher, more unfair, and inferior treatment by whites. One day, Robert Charles became infuriated after hearing the grisly news of the fate of a black man in Atlanta named Sam Hose. Hose was ruthlessly lynched by a large white mob for killing his white boss in self-defense and allegedly raping his boss's white wife. The rape allegation later proved to be false, as Mr. Hose was nowhere near the house at the time the alleged rape took place. The lynching of Sam Hose, by all accounts, was very gruesome and traumatic. Mr. Hose's nose, ears, toes, fingers, genitals, and tongue were all cut off while he was alive, causing him great pain. He was also skinned alive, doused with kerosene, and set on fire while tied to a tree. Hoses, mutilated body parts, and postcards of the tragic event were later sold at stores, picnics, and other functions throughout the Atlanta area. On the night of July 23, 1900, at approximately 11 p.m., three white police officers, Sergeant Jules C. Oquan, August T. Mora, and Joseph D. Cantrell, investigated reports of, quote, two suspicious-looking Negroes sitting on a porch in a predominantly white neighborhood. They found Robert Charles and his roommate, 19-year-old Leonard Pierce, at the scene. The policemen questioned the two men, demanding to know what they, quote, were doing and how long they had been there. One of the two men replied that they were waiting for his girlfriend and her female companion. Charles stood up, which the police wrongly took as an aggressive move. Mora grabbed him, and the two struggled. Mora hit Charles with his billy club. Mora and Charles pulled guns and exchanged shots. Reports are unclear on who drew first. Both men received non-lethal gunshot wounds to the legs. Charles fled the scene to his residence, leaving a trail of blood. Pierce, also armed, was covered by a police officer when Charles ran. 
Charles had returned to his residence by early the next morning when police were trying to find him. Captain Day and a patrol wagon approached Charles's residence on the 2000 block of 4th Street at approximately 3 a.m. on the morning of July 24, 1900. When the police tried to apprehend Charles, he fired upon them with a 38 caliber Winchester rifle, fatally hitting the captain in the heart. Charles shot another policeman in the head. The remaining policemen took refuge in a nearby room and Charles escaped. The police then started a manhunt. At the start of the 20th century, the population of New Orleans was recorded in 1900 as 730,000 white and 650,000 Negro by the 12th census of the United States. Among the latter were many mixed race people whose ancestors had formerly had a distinct status as free people of color before the Civil War, particularly during the years of the French and Spanish control. Those of the white politicians, as they have many times before and many times since, followed the interests of their wealthiest constituents and at the start of the 20th century, passed a new state constitution with provisions that disenfranchise most African Americans by making voter registration more difficult through poll taxes, literacy tests, and similar measures. After that, the white-dominated legislature, primarily Democrats, passed eight Jim Crow laws by 1900. These included a law establishing racial segregation for public facilities, including interstate railroad cars. New Orleans newspapers contributed to racial tensions as they were becoming, quote, more stridently racist in their editorial columns and treatment of the news. The confrontational journalistic practices of Henry J. Hearsay and the state's newspaper caused racial rifts in New Orleans. Hearsay, a former major in the Confederate Army, said in one article that, quote, if blacks listened to the screeds of agitators in the North, the results will be a race war and race war means extermination. Then the Negro problem of Louisiana, at least, will be solved, and that by extermination. And that is the most disgusting thing that has ever come out of my mouth. On July 24, 1900, a large crowd of white people gathered on 4th Street in New Orleans, where the policemen were killed. There were shouts for lynching Charles, but the crowds dispersed when they were falsely told Charles had been located and jailed. The next day, the acting mayor announced a $250 reward for the arrest of Charles while issuing a proclamation urging peace. New Orleans papers, particularly the Times Democrat, blamed the black community for Charles' crimes and calling for action. In the following days, several riots occurred as mobs of armed white people roamed the streets. On the night of the 25th, they killed three black people and wounded six more so severely they had to be hospitalized. Five white people were also hospitalized, and more than 50 people suffered lesser injuries. Charles had taken refuge at 1208 Saratoga Street, which at this present time in March of 2018 is an empty lot, where he remained safe from police until Friday, July 27th. The house was quickly surrounded by police after they learned that Charles was there. Throughout the day, the police fired on the house, where Charles sporadically returned the fire. By the end of the day, Charles had shot a total of 27 white people in the course of the week, seven fatally. Four were policemen. The police decided to burn down the building to flush out Charles. As he tried to escape, he was shot by Charles A. Noiré, a medical student and member of the Special Police, which was a militia police group of volunteer citizens. The policemen and other white bystanders continued to shoot Charles's dead body a total of 37 times. When they dragged his body outside, a mob of bystanders beat his body beyond recognition. Mobs in New Orleans continued to rampage against blacks after learning that Charles had been killed. Police had difficulty taking his body to the morgue as angry white mobs tried to mutilate his corpse. The mob killed several African Americans and burned down the Tommy Lafon schoolhouse, known as, quote, the best Negro schoolhouse in Louisiana. Fred Clark, who had told police where Charles had taken refuge, was assassinated several days later by Louis Forstall, a supporter of Charles. The rioting finally ended after New Orleans Mayor Paul Capdeville deputized 1,500 special police and gained assistance from the state militia. The events in New Orleans had ramifications beyond the state. Lillian Jewett, a young white member of the Anti-Lynching League, 
was fundraising at a Boston, Massachusetts meeting hours after Charles's death to raise money for those who had been injured. The Louisiana press represented this meeting, as the Times-Picayune put it, insane ravings at a Boston meeting. A group of wealthy young white men from New Orleans had formed the Green Turtles the previous year. This group required an oath of allegiance to white supremacy and the Democratic Party. This group's subsequent threats on Jewett's life prevented her traveling any further south than Richmond, Virginia. Whites intensified and increased the reach of racial segregation after the Robert Charles riots. In 1908, the legislature passed a miscegenation law prohibiting interracial marriage or domestic partnerships. This was part of what was considered a progressive movement, influenced also by eugenics. Many states passed similar laws in those years. The city established racial segregation in jails in 1920. The Catholic Church established a segregated parish in downtown New Orleans, the Congregation of Corpus Christi. Racial violence and hate crimes increased in frequency. New Orleans jazz pianist Jelly Roll Morton recounted the 1900 riot in his 1938 oral history recorded for the Library of Congress. Lynchings were still high at the turn of the century as southern states disenfranchised blacks and imposed legal segregation. The agricultural economy was not doing well, adding to economic and social tensions. Later, jazz and blues musicians paid tribute to Robert Charles in his heroic stand by playing a song entitled The Ballad of Robert Charles, a song which cemented Robert Charles' place as a black folk hero for many in the black community. Unfortunately, the song is lost to posterity because many musicians, quote, forgot the song due to fear of retaliation from white patrons and white people in general. Many whites, as well as some blacks, were eager to forget and not address the causes and effects of that particularly sad episode in American history. It has taken many decades, nearly an entire century, to get as far as we have toward total equality. Legally, there is still a long way to go, and socially, even longer. But I still believe that we can get there, as our world gets smaller and smaller with the help of the internet. We must remember that, biologically speaking, there is only one known race of human in existence. To call each other anything other than brother or sister, father or mother, or cousin, is to be untruthful with ourselves and each other. I truly love you all. Thank you so very much for watching, everybody. This video holds a lot of meaning for the kind of message that I want to help put out into the world, which makes it very dear to me. I hope it can inspire you to make change as well. As a reminder, if you'd like to share in the conversation, look for us on Twitter at WakingRibbonsNA or email us at WakingRibbonsNarrations at Hotmail.com. The description holds all that information. Take care of yourselves, everyone. I'll see you very soon.